Welcome back to podcast episode 24. Last episode, we started looking at the late Baroque period, sort of that time from 1700 to 1750. We talked about how the term Baroque has its origins from jewelry and then made its way into art and into music as well. And talked about how the Baroque period was both a time for absolutism, meaning that monarchs and things thought that um, they had the right to rule because of divine right of God, that they were the ultimate rulers, the absolute rulers. While also a lot of scientific discoveries were going on at the same time. People like Isaac Newton were making a lot of their scientific discoveries and advancing the world of science in Europe. And also, we talked about how music was part of daily life in the Baroque period and was supported through one of three ways. In the church, where they wrote sacred music. Then there was the court, so those are kings and lesser nobility who hired musicians to work for them. And then there was the opera house, one of a very few places where you could make a living as a composer that wasn't the church or the court. So those were the main ways to survive as a musician in the Baroque period in Europe. So today let's talk about some of the style features of the late Baroque. If any one characteristic can be singled out as central to the music of the late Baroque period, it would be its thorough, methodical quality. After listening to a short Baroque piece, or to one section of a longer piece, we may be surprised to realize, first, how soon all the basic material is set forth, and second, how much of the music after that consists of inspired repetitions and variations. It is as though the composer had set out with some enthusiasm to draw their material out to the maximum extent and wring it dry. Indeed, the shorter pieces we will be examining later on, like the fugue in C-sharp from Bach's The Well-Tempered Clavier and the aria La Justitia from Handel's opera Julius Caesar, contain little, if any notable contrast in rhythm, dynamics, melody, texture, or tone color. Baroque composers preferred thoroughness and homogeneity. Their longer pieces, Baroque composers tended to break them into blocks of music with contrast with one another in obvious ways, but are still homogeneous in themselves. This is the case with Bach's Fifth Brandenburg Concerto, for example, where the orchestral and solo sections contrast with one another sharply, indeed bluntly. Within each orchestral or solo section, however, things are usually quite regular. So let's break it down and talk about different aspects of music. First, talking about rhythm. Baroque music is brimming with energy, and this energy is channeled into a highly regular, determined sort of motion. Like jazz and other popular music, Baroque music gets its rhythmic vitality by playing off distinctive rhythms against a very steady beat. The meter nearly always stands out, emphasized by certain instruments playing in a clear, incisive way. Most characteristics of these marking time instruments is the busy, crisp harpsichord. Another common feature that hammers home the beat is the so-called walking bass, a bass part that moves in absolutely even notes, usually eighth notes or quarters. In the air from box suite number three in D, the bass keeps going for 138 walking eighth notes plus eight sixteenth notes and one half note at the final cadence, of course. 
Rhythmic variety in the upper instruments is heard in reference to absolute regularity below. Alternative listening will also reveal another aspect of regularity in steady harmonic rhythm. That is, a Baroque piece tends to change chords at every measure or every beat or at some other set interval. This n must not be taken absolutely literally, though, but it is the tendency and it is often the case. Another steady feature of Baroque music is dynamics. Composers rarely used loud and soft indications, or F and P, or forte and piano in their scores, and once a dynamic was chosen or set, it remained at about the same level for the whole section, sometimes even for the whole composition. Neither in the Baroque period nor in any other, however, have performers played or sung music at an absolutely even level of dynamics. Instrumentalists made expressive changes in dynamics to bring out rhythmic accents, and singers certainly sang high notes louder than low nuns. But composers did not go much beyond natural variations of these kinds. Gradual buildups from soft to loud and the like were not used. Abrupt dynamic contrasts were preferred, again, between fairly large sections of a piece or whole movements. A clear forte and piano contrast is built into the concerto genre with its alternating blocks of music for the full orchestra and for one or more quieter solo instruments. When, exceptionally, a Baroque composer changed dynamics in the middle of a section or a phrase of music, he could count on the great surprise, even the amazement of his listeners. A famous sudden forte in Handel's Hallelujah Chorus has been known to electrify the audience to bring them to their feet. We spoke earlier of a characteristic dualism between extravagance and order that can be detected in various aspects of Baroque culture. The methodical, regular quality of Baroque musical style that we are tra tracing here clearly reflects the orderly, quasi-scientific side of this dualism. But Baroque music can also be highly dramatic, bizarre or stupendous, a reflection of the other side of the dualism. Indeed, the magnificent momentary effects that occur occasionally in Handel and Bach are all the stronger because of the regular music around them. Tone color in Baroque music presents something of a contradiction. The early part of the period evinced a new interest in sonority, and the end of it echoed with some sophisticated sounds. Handel's imaginative orchestration in his operas, Bach's notably sensitive writing for the flute, and the refined harpsichord texture developed by several generations of composers in France. There, there are distinctive and attractive Baroque sounds that we do not hear in other periods. The harpsichord, the bright Baroque organ, the virtuoso recorder, and what we're calling the festive Baroque orchestra featuring high trumpets and drums. On the other hand, a significant amount of music was written to allow for multiple or alternative performing forces. Thus, it was a regular practice to designate music for harpsichord or organ, for violin or oboe or flute. Bach wrote a sonata for two flutes and rewrote it as a sonata for viola da gamba, that's a cello-like instrument, and harpsichord. Handel took solo arias and duets and rewrote them as choruses for his oratorio Messiah. In the last analysis, then, it seems the original tone color was often not critical. So as we think about this tone color, we want to think about the orchestras that were making the sounds. The core of the Baroque orchestra was a group of instruments of the violin family. 
The famous orchestra maintained by Louis XIV in the late 17th century was called the 24 Violins of the King. It consisted of six violins, 12 violas, and six cellos. A great deal of Baroque music was written for such an orchestra or a similar one. What would today be called a string orchestra? Violins, violas, cellos, and one or two bass viols. To this was added a keyboard instrument as continuo, usually a harpsichord in secular music and an organ in church music. Woodwinds and brass instruments were sometimes added to the string orchestra too, but there was no fixed complement, as was to be the case later. For special occasions of a festive nature, music celebrating a great victory, for example, or Christmas music ordered for a cathedral, composers augmented the basic Baroque orchestra with trumpets or French horns, timpani, bassoons, and oboes or flutes. This festive orchestra has a particularly grand, open, and brilliant sound. So here with these two charts, you can sort of see the difference between the basic Baroque orchestra and the festive Baroque orchestra. Baroque melody tends towards complexity. Composers like to push melodies to the very limits of ornateness and luxuriance. As a rule, the range of Baroque melodies is extended. They use many different rhythmic note values. They twist and turn intricately and elegantly as they reach high and low. It can be maintained that in a European classical tradition, the art of melody reached a high point in the late Baroque era a point that was never been equaled since. These long, intricate melodies with their wealth of decorations added to the main direction of the line are not easy to sing, however. They hardly ever fall into any simple pattern resembling a tune. Even their appearance on the page seems to tell a story. You can see here how busy the music looks. An easily recognized feature of Baroque melodies is their frequent use of sequence. Remember that the sequence is the same sort of pattern but moved around, and we can see that in this example here as well. Baroque melodies repeatedly catch hold of a motive or some longer section of music and play it again and again at several pitch levels. Sequences provide Baroque music with one of its most effective means of forward motion. As we mentioned before, virtuosity becomes very important in the Baroque period and also improvisation. Not all melodies of the time are as ornate as the one shown previously. However, and some such as simple as de Rock's dances are exceptions to the rule. On the other hand, the most highly prized art of the elite musician of the era, opera singers, was improvising melodic decorations in the arias they sang night after night in the theater. Before the present era of sound amplification, when volume does most of the work, audiences thrilled to brilliant, fast, very high or very low music played and especially improvised by singers and instrumentalists. This is still very much the case with jazz. In the Baroque era, enough improvisations were written down as guides for musicians who were not the most imaginative to give us a good idea of the art of such great virtuosos as the singers Bordoni and Cuzzoni and the violinist composer Vivaldi. They would spontaneously add all kinds of ornaments, jazz players would call them riffs or licks, to whatever scores composers placed before them. Not many modern singers have the technique to recreate this art, but some do, and we hear an example in Handel's aria La Justizia that we'll hear a little bit later. 
The standard texture of Baroque music is polyphonic or contrapuntal. Even the many Baroque pieces that consist of just melody and bass count as contrapuntal because of the independent melodic quality of the bass. And large-scale pieces spin a web of contrapuntal lines filling every nook and cranny of musical space-time. While cellos, bass viols, bassoons, and organ pedals play the lowest line, the other string instruments stake out their places in the middle, with oboes and flutes above them and the trumpets piercing their way up into the very highest reaches of the sound universe. The density achieved in this way is doubly impressive because the sounds feel alive. Alive because they are all in motion, because they are all part of moving contrapuntal lines. Again, some exceptions should be noted to the standard polyphonic textures of Baroque music. Such are the homophonic orchestra sections, the ritornello in the concerto, and Bach's highly expressive harmonizations of old German hymns. But it is no accident that these textures appear within pieces that feature polyphony elsewhere. The Ritornello in Bach's Brandenburg Concerto No. 5 alternates with polyphony played by the solo flute, violin, and harpsichord. The harmonized hymn in this cantata No. 4 comes at the very end, where it has the effect of calming or settling the complex polyphony of the preceding music. Yet, all this polyphony is supported by a solid scaffold of harmony. The central importance of harmony in Baroque music appears in the universal practice of the basso continuo, or just continuo. The continuo is a bass part, the lowest part in a polyphonic music, that is always linked to a series of chords. These chords are played by a harpsichord, organ, or lute as support for the important melodies in the other instruments. Support, or accompaniment, indeed, we might say, mere accompaniment for composers did not bother to write the chords out in detail, but only notated them as an abstract way by a numerical shorthand below the bass part, as you see here. You also see how they might realize that. This left continuo, play, continuo players with a good deal to do, even though their role was considered subsidiary. By reading the basso continuo part, the harpsichordist or organist would play along with the cellos or bassoons. So much for the left hand, which doubles the bass line. But the right hand chords could be played in many ways, high or low, widely or closely spaced, smoothly connected or not, a certain amount of quick, on-the-spot improvisation was, and still is, required to realize a continuo, that is, to derive actual chords from the abstract numbers. Another name for continuo, figured bass, derives from these numerical shorthands. Continuo chords provide the basic harmonic framework against which contrapuntal lines of Baroque music trace their airy patterns. Under the influence of the continuo, Baroque texture may be described as polarized, a polarity of voice between the strong bass and a clear high soprano range, the domain of the melody. Less clearly defined is a middle space containing the improvised chords. In Baroque works on the largest scale, this space is also filled in by polyphonic lines drawn from the median range of the orchestra and chorus, such as violas, tenors, and altos. In more modest works, a characteristic texture is a hollow one. One or two high instruments, like a violin or a flute or voice, a bass instrument, and subsidiary chord improvisation in the middle. Baroque music is usually easily identified by the presence of the continuo, by the continuous but discrete sound of the harpsichord or organ playing continuo chords in the background. Indeed, the Baroque era in music was once called the basso continuo era, 
Not a bad name for it. Musical forms are clearer and more regular in the Baroque period than in most other historical periods. Two factors that appear to have contributed to this, one of them social and the other intellectual, were mentioned earlier. The social factor is the patronage system, whereas the court and the church demanded a large amount of music and expected it to be produced in a hurry almost as soon as it was ordered. Therefore, composers needed to rely on formulas that can be applied quickly and efficiently. What is amazing about the church cantatas that Bach wrote at Leipzig, one a week, is how imaginatively he varied the standard forms of the various components of a cantata. But it was very helpful, in fact, it was absolutely necessary, for him to have those standard forms there as a point of departure. The other factor is the scientific spirit of the age, which affected composers only indirectly, indirectly but affected them nonetheless. One can detect the composer's ambition to map the whole range of a piece of music and to fill it in systematically, in an orderly, logical, quasi-scientific way. This ambition seems to have been based on the conviction that musical time could be encompassed and controlled at a man's will, an attitude similar to that of scientists, philosophers, and craftsmen at the time. In the music of Bach, in particular, shows this tendency on various levels. Look, for example, at the symmetrical arrangement of the seven sections of his cantata number four that we'll see later on. The last fugue in his Art of Fugue, he died before finishing it, is a more famous example. An, ex an ordinary fugue, as we shall see, is a polyphonic composition that deals exclusively with a single theme. This fugue deals with four themes, one after another, in four sections. Then in the last section, all four themes combine in four-part counterpoint. Theme number four spells Bach in a musical code. A simpler Bach feud may still have a ground plan that is simply symmetrical. Finally, let's talk about the emotional world and Baroque music. All music, it seems safe to say, is deeply involved with emotion. But in the music of different cultures, and also in the music of different historical eras within a single culture, the nature of that involvement can vary greatly. The emotional effect of Baroque music strikes the modern listener as very powerful and yet, in a curious way, also impersonal. Baroque composers believe firmly that music could and should mirror a wide, wide range of human feelings, or affects. Such has been analyzed and classified by the scientifically oriented psychology of the day. Composers did not believe, however, that it was their task to mirror feelings of their own. Rather, they tried to isolate and analyze emotions in general, and then depict them consistently. The exhaustiveness of their musical technique made for a similar exhaustiveness of emotional effect. A single movement or aria was usually restricted to depicting one specific emotion, feeling, or mood. As the rhythms and themes are repeated, the music intensifies and magnifies a single strong feeling. Sadness in Baroque music is presented as the deepest gloom, calmness is profound quiet, brightness is pomp and splendor, and happiness is jubilation. These are extreme sentiments. The people who can be imagined to experience them would have to be almost larger than life. All this fits perfectly into the place with the Baroque fascination with the theater. The Baroque theater concentrated on grand gestures and high passion, on ideal emotions expressed by ideal human beings. Kings and queens were shown performing noble actions or vile ones, experiencing intense feelings, delivering thunderous speeches, and taking part in lavish stage to plays. How these personages looked and postured can be seen in this picture that we saw previously. Theatrical emotion has the virtues of intensity, clarity, and focus, 
It has to have if it is to reach its audience. Actors analyze the emotion they are required to depict, shape it and probably exaggerate it, and then methodically project it by means of their acting technique and craft. It is not their personal emotion, though for the moment they make it their own. We may came, come to feel that Baroque composers worked in much the same manner, not only in their operas, actual stage work set to music, but also in their oratorios and church cantatas, and even in their instrumental concertos and sonatas. So next time, we will take a bit of a deeper look at Baroque instrumental music, and we'll start to hear some musical examples. Once again, I'm sorry for this longer one with lots of speaking, but there were lots of things to get through before we really delve into the world of Baroque music. Can't wait to see you for the next one. Cheers. <laughs>